we are in Genesis 43. If you want to turn in your uh, Bibles there, if you need a Bible, we've always got them for you in the back. But uh, we're at the point, we're calling this the brothers return because they make it back down to uh, Egypt uh, once, once again. Well, let's pray. Father, we do just uh, are so thankful that we can study your word together this morning and uh, once again observing the life of Joseph and, well, not only him, but his brothers and, and their father, Jacob, who reaches a real turning point here. And we just pray that you would use, again, this story to help us be forgiving people, uh, that our lives would always be moving in a direction of reconciliation with others when at all possible, so much that we can learn here. And so we, again, just praise the psalmist, Lord, open our eyes that we might see wonderful things uh, in your law, Lord. And I pray that you'd uh, open our eyes uh, to the great things you have in store for us this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, again, Joseph is, uh, is there. And uh, we've talked about a lot uh, in terms of framing a question of uh, how does Joseph do it? You know, how does he... How does he remain uh, somebody that God can use in the way that he does? How does he not become, become angry and cynical? How does he not, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of hold this grudge against his brothers uh, and so forth? And, uh, but he doesn't. And we've kind of looked at some of the principles that have helped him through that. He has forgiven them. We've seen it in the way that he lives his life. There's no bitterness there. Keep in mind, these, these are the brothers that hated him, ridiculed him hassled him, and they are older, older stepbrothers. I mean, some of these guys, when he's 17, they're in their 40s. I mean, there's quite the, uh, the age range. They have kids of their own and so forth. And uh, he deals with all of that, uh, of course, well, all the time, realizing the favoritism shown to him by Jacob, his father, which certainly was a mistake. And then he has the dreams <laughs> that he feels free to share with his brothers that that uh, had this really cool dream, guys, and one day you're all going to bow down before me. Didn't go over real big, uh, and eventually uh, they plot to murder him, but instead they, um, they throw him in a pit and, uh, and sell him into slavery into Egypt. And, Jacob, uh, and uh, Joseph's been able to trust God, whether it was in the pit, in the caravan, whether he's working in Potiphar's house, whether he's in the dungeon because he's been falsely accused of a sexual crime, and whether it's the butler forgetting him, he's been able to trust God, hang on to God's word to him during that whole time period. And then we get to this time where he names his children by the names of them, Manasseh, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, we know that he really has uh, uh, no hardness of heart uh, and he's forgiven his brothers, but it doesn't mean that reconciliation can take place. And we've tried to make a distinction because uh, probably not all of you, but there's probably a few of you that have had other people sin against you. No, we probably all have. And, uh, and sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's very hard things. Uh, and the challenge to us, of course, as believers, uh, is to forgive even as Christ has forgiven us. And uh, again, we've talked about Joseph, that when he was in the pit, he wasn't, he wasn't just right off the bat in that pit going, uh, no problem, always wanted to see Egypt, uh, you know, I got this. No, we know from the Psalms that he was crying bloody murder. And he was begging for his life while his brothers were eating lunch. And, um, but somehow he's able to process all of this, uh, trust God, believe God, and God's sovereignty that he has a purpose for his life as he does all of us. He's able to forgive. It doesn't mean he can be reconciled. And so now it gets to not so much how does Joseph do it, but why is he doing what he's doing? It would appear some very strange things. His brothers show up. Why not just reveal himself? Hey, it's me. You can have all the food you want. No, he stays undercover. He stays in disguise. Looks like an Egyptian, speaks like an Egyptian, allows one of his stewards to carry on a conversation in Hebrew with him. Uh, and basically then as they leave, he's accused them of spies. He hangs on to one of the brothers uh, and as they leave, he puts their money back in their sacks, which messes with <laughs> their minds. And they don't know what that means. Uh, but they're pretty sure it's not good. Because now this man may believe that not only are they spies, but also they're thieves as well. So there's a lot of drama going on here. But again, what starts all of this 
is the fact that they begin their lives by being envious and jealous uh, of Joseph. And I want to quote uh, one of the leading theologians of our time. I have a picture of him here. Troy Palomalo, one of the leading theologians of our times. Plays football a little bit as well, but uh, uh, a believer in, uh, in Jesus Christ. Talks about, uh, in an interview I read with him a while back, just the uh, initial struggles with pride and so forth. Because even as an athlete, you can imagine how skilled he was even in high school and then through his career at USC, uh, the tendency to go to ego and pride and so forth. And you hear a lot of that, you know, that, that you're supposed to be prideful and uh, and everything. He says as a believer, he kind of struggled with some of those bigger issues, but as he matured in his faith in Christ, then he found it was other issues that he had to deal with. And he says this, it's the big things that are the easiest to turn away from. It's the accumulation of small things that are hard. People know adultery is bad and murder is bad. I'm not going to go out and sleep with the first girl I see. But when your eyes start wandering and you become a little more jealous and envious uh, and these passions start rising up inside of you, that's when it really becomes dangerous because the devil doesn't work that way in terms of the big stuff. His strategy is always to be very subtle and to continue to build on top of that evil seed that he's planted. Jealousy, envy, seems like it's not that bad of a thing may not have seemed like that bad of a thing with these brothers and certainly justified because of the way Jacob treated Joseph, but it's grown to something much worse. Joseph needs to know if he can be reconciled to his brothers. Where are they at? What's in their hearts now? And where is Benjamin? He wasn't there when they came before. He asked, is he still alive? Yes, he's still alive. All he knows is, well, they could be even lying about that. In other words, Joseph gets uh, all the attention and he's sold into slavery. Now, Benjamin, his brother, younger brother, would get all the attention and that special robe. How would the brothers treat him? Have they sold him into slavery? Have they killed him? Uh, he wants to know. He wants to know what happened to Benjamin and how are they treating him and what's in the heart of his brothers. Well, let's go to our story as the situation is becoming more severe. We say in the first seven verses, the circumstances of the return to Egypt uh, were severe. Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You will not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, Why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you had still another brother? But they said, The man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words. Could we possibly have known that he would say, Bring your brother down. So they, uh, they're kind of between a rock and a hard place because they, they're out of food, uh, but if they go down, they can't go without, uh, without Benjamin because that member, Joseph, who they don't know who he is yet, he's just the Lord of the land, the prime minister of Egypt. He has said, prove to me that you're not spies by bringing your younger brother so that I can see him. So they can't really go without him. Of course, they know their father is not going to release Benjamin. So this is the, their dilemma. We first say about these circumstances, they include the severity of the famine. Uh, it is worldwide at this point. And, uh, and we knew that that was going to happen, that it would spread from Egypt, of course, to Canaan and the surrounding areas. Uh, now, again, Philip, uh, before the Sanhedrin in uh, Acts chapter 7, we've gotten to him several times because he, he basically, uh, in his defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and their, their rejection of Jesus goes through the history of, uh, of the Jews. So he gives us a Holy Spirit-inspired commentary on many of these incidents we've been studying. And about this he says, Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. If you're not sure what that means, the New Living uh, Translation puts it this way. But a famine came upon Egypt and Canaan. There was great miseries, 
and our ancestors ran out of food. <laughs> That's what it means when it says it's severe. They ran out of food, uh, so they have no bread. Uh, they're not able to sustain themselves. So things have got to get pretty bad before the question is even brought up uh, to return to Egypt, and of course, following that is the need to take Benjamin with him. Of course, this has been the forbidden subject uh, to talk about, uh, and even when Jacob brings it up, he says, uh, uh, verse 2, go back and buy us a little food. Just like run down to 7-Eleven real quick, you know. Uh, Judah jumps in uh, and says, hey, the man warned us. You shall not see my face. In other words, you're not going to buy any grain unless your brother's with you. In fact, if you show up without him, it will be admission of your own guilt. You really are spies. And of course, in G Egypt at that time, we know spies receive uh, the death penalty. So Judah's trying to do his best to try to lay out the reasoning why they need to take Benjamin. Notice Jacob's reaction in verse 6. Why do you deal so wrongfully with me? As to tell the man whether you still had an, uh, uh, another brother. There's more going on here, obviously, besides just the fact that uh, uh, Benjamin is there. Why would you tell him? Why would you deal so wrongfully with me? In other words, as you have in the past. Like, where's Joseph? Like, Joseph, again, we've kind of pointed this out. Uh, uh, Jacob knows his sons. And he knows that two of them are, are murderers already. He knows some things about the others. <laughs> this is a pretty gnarly bunch of guys, the patriarchs. Uh, they're a pretty gnarly bunch of guys. And, uh, and so when, when he sends his son Joseph off one day, and they return with his bloody garment, no body, no nothing, and, oh, yeah, hey, we don't really know what happened to him, but, uh, you know, we did find this. You know, he goes in the morning, he mourns the rest of his life over Joseph. And in the back of his mind, he's always wondering what really happened to my son. And it's very obvious from other dialogues, he doesn't really trust these guys. And so he reacts, here we go again. Why do you deal with me so wrongfully? So the circumstances are several that lead to the return to Egypt. Uh, and uh, in the same way, then conditions are set or preconditions for his allowing Benjamin to go with them. We see that in verse 8. Then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require of him if I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we'd have returned the second time. And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Here's some of the conditions. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessel and carry down a present for the man, a little balm, a little honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also. And arise and go back to the man. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man. That he may release your older brother and Benjamin. If I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. So several conditions here on the return. One begins with the offer from Judah there in verse 8. Now it's interesting that Judah the, becomes the spokesman for, for these, uh, these other brothers. Again, 12 in all. Uh, you know, Simeon, Simeon is being held as a potential spy there in Egypt by Joseph. Uh, Joseph is there. The other brothers are here. Uh, but again, he's the number four brother. Remo uh, Reuben, <coughs> remember, had kind of diminished himself by committing incest. Then you've got Simeon and uh, Levi, or Levi, number two and three. Those happen to be the mass murderers uh, in the family. Uh, so they've uh, also kind of disqualified themselves from any kind of leadership within the family. So it kind of falls to, uh, to Judah. And he kind of steps up here and basically says, I'll take personal responsibility. Uh, and if there's some reason that I can't bring him back, I will bear the guilt my entire life before you. Wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> from, from a bunch of squabbling guys that were pretty much into blame shifting and never wanted responsibility uh, for anything. We certainly see a change here uh, in his life. And, uh, and he's saying, and by the way, uh, we don't have a lot of time to spare. Who knows what's happened to Simeon? It's been two years since we've been down there. So he's saying time is of the essence. 
Uh, the conditions also then include a, a list of gifts in verse 11. A little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, pistachio notes, and almonds take double the money, uh, and so forth. Two things that are interesting about this. Uh, one is that, well, it appears that, well, Jacob is kind of being Jacob here a bit. Uh, he says, basically, if you're going to go back and we hope things are going to go well, we're going to send some omiyagi. <laughs> we're going to send some gifts ahead of you. Uh, that's what he did with Esau, right, in his attempt to be reconciled to his brother. They're going to go back. The last time he sees his big brother, Esau, Esau says, by the way, if I see you again, I'll probably kill you. Uh, it's been several years. He's returning from Padan Aram. He's got all of his wives. He's got all of his kids. He's got all of his herds. And remember, he lines them up in a certain order in a sense to try to pacify uh, uh, Esau. And when you see Esau, tell him, my Lord Esau, these are gifts for you. Well, here we go again. Uh, with the list of gifts. We're going to see a good turning point here in a moment. But the other aspect about this that is just kind of a coincidence, it's interesting. If you go back to Genesis 37, when Joseph was sold into slavery to the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, and they had down, it lists the cargo that they're taking, and it's these items. It's almost like we've come full circle all the way down to the silver. Uh, the other condition here if they're going to go, it's going to require a prayer for mercy. And this is a turning point. It's kind of the key, uh, key verse in this particular chapter, verse 14. If you're a Bible underliner, you might want to look at this. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man. It's kind of a short little prayer. But what he's saying basically uh, is that uh, I'm praying that God will have mercy. And uh, that's always a good prayer. Last week, we, uh, we talked about what it was to be good citizens and so forth. We had a, a little message about that. We got down on our knees, literally prayed for our country, and we sure didn't pray that God would give us what we deserve. We prayed for his mercy. Uh, always, always pray for mercy. I mean, a lot of times we're just praying for people. I mean, whether it's to be healed or whatever it is, Lord, we're just praying... God, none of us deserve this. None of us deserve to be healed by you, but by your mercy, God, because of your favor and your love and your kindness, may you do this. That's always a good way to prayer. Did these guys deserve anything from God and his protection over them? Not so far. <laughs> they, they were in, certainly deserving of his judgment. So their father prays for mercy. And who does he pray to? Notice he prays to El Shaddai. That's the name that he uses uh, in the Hebrew. This is the God that's powerful, the God that can, uh, that can do uh, anything. As one writer said, El Shaddai in Genesis is associated with blessing, promises, and a revelation of himself. And Jacob says, this is the God that I know. This is the God that we can trust. This is the God that is powerful. We can believe his promises, his word, and I'm going to appeal to him based on mercy that he'll watch over you. This, this isn't like, well, guys, have a good time, and hey, hey, Lord bless you guys on the way down there. See, this is, it's very short, uh, but there's a lot more going on here. And uh, so, so, well, I, I just tell you, it's so important. I don't know if you ever, uh, there's probably a few of you that watch ESPN once in a while and catch the, the top ten plays of the week. My uh, TV viewing seems to get uh, narrower and narrow, so, the, you know, sometimes that's, that's all I got is the top ten. What's, what's going on this week? Uh, but in heaven, you probably didn't know this, they have a top ten prayer every week. And I happen to know that this week, that prayer made number two. Uh, top tens in all the world. This was it, number two. Now, you probably wonder what the number one prayer of the week was. I happen to know that as well. Uh, it's the next line that he says, which is very interesting. Uh, he basically says, and if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. Well, what does that mean? Again, New Living puts it this way. May God Almighty give you mercy as you go before the men, so that he will release Simeon and let Benjamin return. But if I must lose my children, so be it. That's pretty heavy-duty submission to the Lord, huh? It's like, this is what we need to do. Lord, and I'm going to trust you. I'm going to pray for mercy, Lord, but I'm going to submit everything to you. And if I lose both of my kids, if I lose all of my kids, Lord, so be it. I'll still trust you anyway. See, that's why that made number one. God's real big on this whole thing of submission and trust. You don't get much... That's pretty heavy-duty, right? I mean, you just... You ever had to pray that for your own kids? 
Now you probably can pray it when things are going pretty good. Lord, we just, I'll just give my kids to you and trust you. But it's a little different when they're going into surgery. And you're saying, Lord, I trust you. They're going to come through okay. But Lord, <coughs> even if they don't, so be it. I trust you anyway. That's, that's kind of the, the kind of prayer that, well, no, no wonder in the scripture it calls him Israel at this point instead of Jacob. It calls him Israel, governed by God. And certainly his life is being governed by God. And it's something that we should all want in our lives. But it's a kind of a hard place to get to. And Jacob's been through some tough times to really learn that God is good. And he always has our best in mind, even when we can't see it ourselves. It reminds me of, well, it's my highlight of the life of David. You know, David we refer to as the, uh, the man after God's own heart. That's what scripture says. Of course, we know that... <laughs> That wasn't always the case. You know, David, David did some horrible things uh, in his life. And, and sometimes people are baffled over this idea, of David being a man after God's own heart. And I think it's because of the episodes in his life when he really did do the right thing. And one of those times, well, it was when his son Absalom rebelled against him. If you're familiar with the story, it's in 2 Samuel 15. I'll read a couple of verses there, but just to kind of set the scene, Absalom is coming. Absalom has been able to basically get some of the leadership of the nation uh, and some of the wise counselors uh, on his side to usurp the authority of David. Uh, he's been able to get uh, much of the military, at least in terms of the, the mass numbers, on his side as well. And he's headed to Jerusalem. David doesn't want any bloodshed in Jerusalem, the place where he's brought the Ark of uh, the Covenant, where the worship of God is and so forth. Uh, and he's also got with him, though, heading out. He's going to leave. He's basically going to uh, head down the, the Kidron across the, uh, the, uh, the brook there and out into the wilderness and uh, get away from the city and if he can survive the, all of this somehow. And there's the, the scene where the whole city is weeping because their king is, uh, is leaving them at this point. There's a guy at the, uh, at the bottom down there, uh, Shammai, who when David goes by, he's throwing rocks at him and calling curses down on him. And David's got basically his, well, it's his, uh, his private bodyguard. It's uh, his equivalent of uh, the Navy SEALs or a Delta Force guy. It's his top guys uh, around him. And one of the guys just says... Uh, just give me permission and I'll take the guy's head off. And that's not a figure of speech. That's, that's literally what he would have, would have done. And David says to him at that point, no, no, don't do it. How do I know God didn't have him come down here to say these things to me? Maybe God wants me to hear this. So you leave him alone. There's another scene here in verse 22 that goes along with that. So it says, uh, David said to Ittai, uh, go and cross over. Uh, then Ittai the Gittite and all of his men uh, and all of his little ones who were with him crossed over. And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the peoples crossed over. The king himself also crossed over the brook Kidron. And all the people crossed over towards the way of the wilderness. Then uh, there was Zadok also, and all the Levites were with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God, and Abiathar went up until all the people had finished crossing over from the city. Then the king said to Zadok, Carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he'll bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. But if he says thus, I have no delight in you, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. Will I be king again? Will I rule here? David says, I don't know. I'm just going to trust the Lord. If God wants me to be king again, it's going to happen. I'll come back and be king. And if God doesn't want me to be king again, that's okay with me. He'll do what seems good to him, and I'm going to rest in that, whatever that is. He doesn't know the outcome. He doesn't know how it's all going to work out. Uh, the whole country is weeping over his departure. Uh, but it's a scene of his complete submission to God at this point, which he hasn't always been very, very good at. Uh, it's, it's a big issue in our lives. David's a guy that grew up in, in terms of uh, uh, experiencing uh, rejection first from his father, and we know that because when Samuel comes out to anoint his sons, uh, that uh, Jesse, the dad, doesn't even count David as a son. He lines up all of his sons, but, but he sends David out to take care of the sheep and doesn't even count him as a son. 
He puts up with constant ridicule from his older brothers. And we see that in the scene prior to the battle with, with Goliath. They just rail on him all the time. And he deals with that. David, as a kid and as a teenager, had learned to turn to the Lord in those times of rejection and look to him. And that's when he writes so many of the Psalms. But with the tremendous victory and, uh, and uh, the great military leader uh, and warrior and fighter that he was, he kind of gains his own independence. He becomes not so submitted to God. And God takes the whole kingdom away from him just to teach him once again what it was to walk with him in a life of submission. And David would write this on Psalm 62, 5. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. David learned that as a kid, as a teenager. Uh, he's come back to it as a, as a grown man. <clears throat> if he wants me to be king again, great. If he doesn't, I'm okay with that. Um, my life is his. I'm submitted to him. You know, and we're, we're okay. You know, our life is submitted to the Lord when things are good. <laughs> when things are not so good, it gets a little tougher to trust him. This is pretty heavy with Jacob. You guys go down. I'm praying to El Shaddai. The God that is powerful, the God that is personal to me, I'm praying for mercy. And if he brings it and you come back, great. And if I lose all of you, I'm still going to trust God. It's a, it's a real turning point, certainly in the life of Jacob. You know, and, and that's the way it is. Uh, God is using Joseph in his steadfast obedience and his trust in God to impact the rest of the members of his family. He doesn't know that, right? I mean, he just, he's just trusting God, doing the best he can, living a life of integrity. You know, he's, he's, not, he's not Skyping with Jacob at night to see what's going on back there. Uh, he doesn't know what's going on. But God is definitely using his life in ways that he's totally unaware of uh, at, uh, at this point. And certainly that's something for us to keep in mind as well. So the circumstances to the, of the return are very severe. And uh, uh, the problem is uh, they can't go without uh, Benjamin, but Judah steps up and says, I'll take full responsibility. And that's, that's always something that's got to happen if any kind of reconciliation in a relationship is going to take place. Somebody's got to say, it's my fault, I bear the responsibility, it's my shame, and I am so sorry. Somebody's got to be able to say that. Uh, the condition for their return, again, is predicated on uh, this prayer for mercy, uh, in a submission uh, to God. Uh, and again, these are all things that are important if we're going to have that kind of reconciliation with people in our lives. Uh, the big concern for the brothers as they head down, well, <laughs> Joseph has messed with their minds pretty good, and they're still pretty fearful because of that. They thought they bought some grain, and that he has their money put back in the, the grain sacks. They find it out later, and they're not going, hey, hit the lottery here. These idiots, you know, put their money back in our bags. No, they, they're going, okay, now we've gone from spy to thief, and um, this is not good. They're more than a little concerned, we would say, as they return with the money. Uh, verse 15, so the men took that present and Benjamin, and they took double money in their hand and rose and went down to Egypt. And they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with him, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, It is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in. So he may take, make a case against us and seize us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. When they drew near to the st uh, steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks, and there each man's money was in the mouth of a sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it back in our hand, and we have brought down the other money, in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. But he said, uh, in Hebrew, right? 
Peace be unto you, peace be with you, do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water. And they washed their feet and he gave their donkeys feed. Uh, then they made the present ready for Joseph coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there. So the concern first is the return money with them. Uh, and they bow before him once again, coming to, uh, to get the money. And this time, the dream is fulfilled. The dream that he had uh, as, a, as a young teenager. God gave him those two dreams, and one of them was that all of his brothers would come and bow before him. It almost happened the first time, but somebody was missing. Benjamin, what happened to him? Do they still treat him like they treated me? Is he still alive? Well, not only is he alive, he's in front of, of Joseph. At least he can see from some point. Obviously, there are his stewards that are there before him speaking Hebrew. Joseph remains uh, in disguise at this point. Uh, and, uh, and things for them seem to go from bad to worse. Uh, as he says, take these men to my home, slaughter an animal, make ready, and so forth. So they're, they're, they're a little freaked out because now they're going to be moved out of the public arena where everybody else is buying food, uh, and they're being moved into a, a private home away from the crowd, and it's at high noon. And on the way down on their iPad, they've been watching these old Clint Eastwood movies. I just got to fill in, you probably weren't aware of this. High noon's a bad time. That means a big showdown. So they're very concerned because it's high noon. I'm just kidding, of course. Somebody's going to ask me about that later. The concern of the return money was with them when they came to Joseph's house. And, of course, that's what they make a, a, a reference to. It was, it was common knowledge that ranking Egyptian officials maintained private dungeons in their homes. And uh, so, th again, the idea that they're being taken to a private home uh, was, again, not seen as a good thing. Uh, it was seen as a very terrible thing, uh, and they are obviously very fearful. And they're like, it's because of the money. <laughs> we, we knew it all along. Uh, notice the concern then for the money uh, is with them, even when the steward greets them in the name of God. And this is, again, uh, incredible. It should be incredible to them. Uh, notice the greeting of the steward, verse 23, uh, which again would have been in Hebrew to them. Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Uh, and what he's saying when he says, peace be unto you, he's saying, shalom lakim. It's like, it's the greeting. It means welcome into my home. And it means if you're coming in my home, I will care for you. I will take care of you. You are absolutely secure. I pledge my protection over you. This guy says to them in Hebrew, and it had to come to some uh, sort of major relief. In other words, he was saying, no worries, brah. <laughs> it's going to be all right. Uh, this, you know, had to have real, uh, just amazing for them to hear this phrase and the idea that it was the God of your fathers that allowed that money to be back in your sack. Yeah, I had it, but it was God who was providentially working and looking over your lives. Wow, that's from this Egyptian guy? You know, and it's like, at that point, it's like, man, their thoughts have, have to be turned towards the Lord. They didn't really know what was going on, how this was turning out. But this little phrase had to, had to really have their heads, uh, heads spinning. That's, that's for sure. Uh, we've got some, uh, you know, friends will be going to uh, China, you know, in the fall and uh, taking the... Uh, Bibles and materials into the house church, we've, we've done many times. I've never had this experience. We've been caught before uh, and had to deal with a translator. You just hope you have a good translator, you know, because eh, I don't speak a lot of uh, Mandarin. I can ask for coffee at Starbucks. That's about as far as it goes. And I can tell them, don't put ice in my drink at McDonald's. That's the limit to my Mandarin. So it's not going to do us uh, very much good. Uh, but uh, I, we had a good translator uh, that eventually I was able to share the gospel with and everything, but uh, uh, our other good friends were down there, and there were some extenuating circumstances under which they were allowed to get through customs, but that uh, customs agents saw the materials, and then they were followed and followed to their hotel, and then they were followed for a couple of days, hoping to see where they would take the materials, because again, it's not what they're going to do to us, because we hold this thing called a United States passport. It's our uh, ticket out of here uh, anytime we need it. Uh, but they're trying to get the, uh, the Chinese guys on, on that end. 
uh, who are receiving the material. So they had followed him a little bit, and, and apparently, uh, you know, they had not made a drop or a delivery that they had detected. So they went into the hotel room and just pulled him out of the hotel room, and then took him downstairs uh, to uh, interrogate them. And uh, I guess it's a common thing in China to have interrogation rooms uh, in hotels. Uh, you probably don't have that at the Marriott here, but uh, they have it there. And so they take them down there and they separate the two guys uh, and, uh, who kind of do these things all the time. And they question them and question them. And the same thing is uh, going through their minds. You know, I hope that this translator is saying what we're saying. And he's not saying, yes, we're spies. And yes, we work for the United States government. And, you know, you don't really know. You're just hoping that what you're saying is being translated correctly. Well, they go on for about an hour. They take them back to their rooms. Uh, the door shuts. Uh, and then the door opens again. And the translator puts his head in the door and says, Praise the Lord, brothers. And then shuts the door and walks off. So they had a good translator. He probably said exactly what those guys needed to hear so these guys could, uh, could be on their way. But to hear in that situation... Praise the Lord, brother. You're a little nervous about what's going on. That was very reassuring for these guys to hear. Shalom, Lakim. It was like, okay, something good just happened here. You know, uh, remember they think they might be killed or imprisoned. A good turnout would be to become a slave. So this is this is huge uh, for them. And, the, and uh, this steward's point was that it was God who was working all of these circumstances. Yes, I'm the one that took the money, but it was the God, your God and the God of your fathers that was watching over you. Uh, and, uh, and here this pagan steward uh, instructs them about God's providential care. Now, again, what were they thinking? We don't really know, but then suddenly Simeon is brought in after two years in the dungeon. Now, he probably looked like he was at the Club Med for two years, you know. I mean, Joseph, this is his brother. He's making sure he's taken well care of. Uh, and this all had to bring tremendous reassurance, but they couldn't imagine what lay before them. So again, some pretty severe circumstances that lead them down there, uh, but they're able to do it because Judah steps up and says, I will take personal responsibility. Uh, there's conditions before they'll go down, and the primary, con primary condition will be Jacob praying to El Shaddai for God's mercy to be over their sons. They go with the returned money, that had brought tremendous fear in their hearts, but their father's prayer, well, has it been answered? Yeah, they are being shown mercy. Jacob's prayer had been answered. The fourth thing we invert, see in verse 26 to 34 was Joseph would continue his disguise. Why? <laughs> Another test. When Joseph came home, they brought him the present, which was in their hand uh, into the house and bowed before him to the earth. Then he asked them about their well-being, and, uh, and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? Uh, and he, uh, he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother, so Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out. And he restrained himself and said, Serve the bread. So they set him a place by himself uh, and uh, them by themselves. And the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they set before him the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. Then he took servings to them from before him. But Benjamin's serving was five times as much <coughs> as any of theirs, so they drank and were merry with him. So Joseph again continues his disguise. He meets with them. And uh, probably one of the more uh, touching scenes, if we can uh, uh, imagine this, and you know, Joseph, uh, the 17 years and being a slave, being in prison, now rising to this point of prime minister, you know, seeing the other brothers come, holding Simeon, hoping against all hope that maybe they had changed, maybe they hadn't killed his younger brother. Perhaps he would really see him again one day. Perhaps God's uh, vision, his dream that he's hung on to all of these years would, uh, would happen before his eyes. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, uh, it does. 
uh, when they come in and he says, is your father well? The old man whom you spoke of, is he still alive? He's literally saying, uh, does your father have shalom? Does he have peace? That's literally what it says in the, in the Hebrew, ha shalom. Uh, the man of whom you spoke, is he still alive? And then they answer in the same way. Your father, uh, your servant, our father, is in shalom. He is in peace. He is in, uh, he is in good health. And certainly, again, we see this prayer for mercy uh, in God's grace. Uh, and we see it uh, in the words that they speak one to another. Uh, the steward speaking to them uh, of uh, God's peace, shalom, and the way they address each other here. Uh, and then the scene of uh, Benjamin once again in verse 29. In addressing Benjamin, Joseph uh, communicates almost you know, a parental kind of affection when he says, God be gracious to you, my son. And uh, this is kind of the same phrase that would eventually find itself in, do, in number 625 and what's referred to as the Arianic benediction. Aaron the high priest would come out and uh, bless the people in this way. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Again, mercy and grace and peace are throughout this passage. And uh, this is a very unique phrase. Uh, it does not appear elsewhere in the Old Testament. So again, these brothers kind of should have been wondering, what, what is going on here? You know, we've got the steward that speaks Hebrew to us and tells us about God's providential care uh, and that it's the God of our God and the God of our fathers. He, he speaks God's peace to us the way any Jewish person would as we enter a home. Uh, and now uh, he has seated us in arrangement. So it goes the oldest to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, all in order. They had to be, what in the world's going on? How does this guy know uh, all, of, uh, all of this stuff? Uh, but again, and then the greeting to, uh, to Benjamin himself. Joseph continues to disguise, uh, again, seating them in the, this age order. One writer said, The simple satisfaction of hunger would not be considered a meal in the Bible. The acceptance of a guest into the fellowship of a meal is therefore simultaneously the granting of participation in one's own existence. Again, we don't, you know, we, you know, we kind of do fast food. We do a lot of things. But in the Middle East today, uh, and in this day, to sit and eat together was, was a huge thing. Uh, because, again, that, uh, that, that food that you all consumed together, uh, the same food was nourishing both of you. In a sense, you were becoming one with that person. So if you invited someone in, you had a meal with them, it was much more than a meal. So here they were. And again, uh, the Egyptians are up there because they had a disdain for, uh, for the Hebrews because they were shepherds. And we'll, we'll find out about that later in Scripture. Joseph is the Lord, so he's, uh, he is by himself. But they're wondering, what is going on? But there is a test in the middle of the meal. And the test comes in the way it's served. They each, they each get probably a, a, a generous portion of food. And then it comes to... Baby Benjamin, <laughs> here, here at the end, oldest to the youngest, and he gets five times the amount of food. I don't think because he looked really skinny or something. It's like, man, let's put some meat on this kid's bones. This is just Joseph. How would the brothers react? Would they be jealous and would they be envious? It's not a big thing, but it was maybe be an indication. The big test is coming up, of course, uh, in, the, in the next narrative. But this is going to give him some indication of where the brothers are at. Do they still have a disdain for one of their brothers, even if he's favored? Do they hate him the way that they hate me? Again, we mentioned at the beginning this idea of the problem in our own hearts sometimes, the way Satan attacks us is through the subtle things like jealousy, like envy, where they become seeds that can grow. And that's what's happened to the brothers. And Joseph wants to know what's going on in their own hearts. One writer makes a real distinction between the idea of covetousness versus envy. One is much worse. One is much more personal. He says a coveter has empty hands and wants to fill them with somebody else's goods. The envier has empty hands and therefore wants to empty the hands of the envied. Envy, moreover, carries carries overtones of personal resentment. An envier resents not only somebody else's blessing, but also the one who's been, been blessed. Now remember, the brothers envied Joseph. 
And when he came out to them on that day uh, to search for them uh, while they were taking care of the father's sheep and so forth, they envied him because of his coat of many colors. So when they got him and they stripped it off of him and they threw him into the pit, did they all try it on because they always wanted a coat like that? No, they tore it into pieces and threw it to the ground. That's what they did. That's, that's a, a major difference between, yeah, I like that car. I think I like one, you know, or I want that car. And I hope that guy never has a car to drive the rest of his life because I can't stand that guy. That's envy. And it begins with jealousy, and Satan will let that grow as a seed, and he'll bring those whisperings and those little thoughts in your mind, you know, to bring it to envy and to full rage, which the brothers have had. But how would they treat, uh, uh, again, Benjamin at, uh, at this point? Well, actually, they treat him fine. It doesn't matter. It's not an issue. Notice the verse line. It seems simple. So they drank and were merry with them. They just <laughs> partied out. To that. And they said they didn't care. Hey, he's got five times as much. Hey, it's good with us, man. We don't care. We're not dying. We're not being slaves. God is good. You know, they're, they're okay with, uh, with all of this. That guy's greeting us with a piece that says we can come in here and be safe and secure. Man, this thing's going way better than we thought. It. They don't really care anymore. They're so focused on what God is doing for them in their lives. You know, it, it's okay if he blesses somebody else more. Is it okay if he blesses somebody else more? It, it really is. In the final analysis, all that matters is, have we been reconciled to God? And are we able then in that position to rec reconcile other people. Paul says that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. It's very tough to be that ambassador if we're kind of ticked at people. <laughs> Even if we've forgiven them, we don't know if we can be reconciled. Joseph doesn't know yet. He's got to find out what's in their heart. Have they repented? Uh, this is a huge issue. This is not a guy that you know, put their knife in the side of his tire, give him a flat tire one day. This is his brothers that uh, treated him horribly and uh, debated whether they should kill him in cold blood. And they finally slow, uh, sold him into slavery. He really needs to know and wants to know uh, what's in their hearts. But uh, this is kind of what he's seeing. Alan Roth explains it this way. In this chapter, the brothers promised to take the blame for any... Uh, uh, um, Catastrophic, uh, <laughs> gave the brain for any catastrophe. I don't know why that was so hard. It just looked strange. Responsibility. They acknowledge. Um, good thing I put it up on the screen so you can help me out. They acknowledge their culpability uh, and made restitution for the money in their sacks. They retrieved their money from prison uh, in Egypt. They recognized God was at work in the midst. Uh, 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 showing belief and they rejoiced in their provision even when a brother was receiving more than they were they were still had gratitudes in their hearts so mercy is written all over this account from beginning to end and God is, uh, is working uh, again the old classic hymn of William Cropper says uh, God moves in mysterious way his wonders to perform he plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. There, there's just a lot of times it's a lot easier to trust God than others. You know, things are going well. It's obvious God's blessing we're all, we're all good with uh, worshiping the Lord and, and trusting him and, and uh, submitting our lives to him. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's easy to do that when, uh, when uh, we see the evidence of God's graciousness and, and his goodness. It's just a whole different thing. When it appears, it appears that things are not going well. It doesn't mean things aren't going well, but from our limited vantage point, it appears that things are, uh, are, not, uh, are not going well. That's when we need to still, like Jacob, of all people uh, in this narrative, decide to, to trust him no matter what. He says, if, he, if I never see my kids again, I never see them. But I'm still going to trust God. 
I don't see him, it's because he's got a reason, he's got a purpose. One day in heaven, I'll see it, I'll figure it out, and I'm, I'm okay with that and waiting until I'm with glory. Because our issue is that uh, we can trust him if we know why. Okay, I just lost my job, uh, and I'm okay with that, Lord. Just show me why. Right? But he's like, no why. You just have to trust me. You know, maybe you'll see that why eventually. The Apostle Paul healed all these people, but uh, couldn't heal himself. Prayed three times, you know, for God to heal him. And God says, sorry. But my, my grace, though, is sufficient for you. And Paul says, you know, that's, that's what I really learned that God's power is perfected in weakness. He says, therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. And, uh, and that's what we need to learn to do as well. If we do that and have that kind of attitude, I think we're going to see a lot more reconciliation in relationships around us. We'll truly be Christ's ambassadors who can talk about a reconciliation that we've had with God and other people can have with God as well. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we need to pray. We need, for, we need your mercy. Uh, we need your grace. And there's just, uh, there are times it's just easy to rejoice and trust you, Lord. And there's times it's just it's flat out difficult. Because we want to know why things are happening to us. Why you've allowed certain things to come into our lives. Or things to be taken away. Or the unexpected things we never saw coming. And uh, I don't think Jacob ever saw this coming with his kids and Joseph that he loved so dearly and now Benjamin being taken away from him and he's left back in the tents there in Canaan and just trying to believe the promises that you made to Abraham, Isaac, and to him. That someday there would be a land and someday it would be theirs and someday there would be the seed and someday there would be the Messiah and someday there, uh, through that Messiah he would be the blessing to the whole world. Well, he couldn't really see it but he was... We just going to trust, trust your word. Lord, and I pray that uh, we'd be able to trust your word, hang on to your word as well. And uh, you'd help us come to a great gratitude. That we'd be like those brothers rejoicing around that table. We don't care if somebody's got more. We're just glad we've got something. And we're glad that some guy greeted us. Told us peace and security. Come in here. Everything's okay. Lord, I pray that we be so caught up in the banqueting tables of the Lord that we wouldn't become envious and jealous of others. Lord, that those seeds would never grow in our hearts. Lord, in that you would use us to bring reconciliation to a lost and dying world. And uh, just pray that uh, you would help anyone that's struggling in this area uh, by your grace just to see your goodness all the more, Lord, they fall more in love with you and be able to let go of maybe of the things that are preventing them from enjoying all that you would have them know and experience in, in this life, Lord. So we just pray for that ministry of your spirit in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. He's the Savior. He's the one who heard our